Well, according to the American Psychiatric Association, addiction is a complex condition of the brain where a person has compulsive substance use despite there being harmful consequences. People with addiction tend to have an intense focus on what they're addicted to, to the point where it takes over their life. What makes it so hard to break an addiction is that it can change the way your brain is wired, giving you harsh cravings that make it difficult to stop. Studies of brain imaging have even shown changes in the areas of the brain that relate to judgment, decision-making, learning, memory, and behavior control. So is this what's happening with Facebook and social media? It's hard to say for sure. That being said, we are starting to give more credit to an addiction that might be pretty similar video games. That's because the American Psychiatric Association includes internet gaming disorders as disorders that require further research, but that can result in clinically significant impairment or distress. The World Health Organization has also added gaming disorders to their international classification of diseases, which is used by medical practitioners around the world to diagnose conditions. Now, online video games are obviously not the same as sites like Facebook, yet they do have similar social aspects. It's possible that in the future, we'll see health organizations also classify social media as a type of an addiction or disorder. Still, sites like Facebook do have quite a few qualities that make you want to come back to them. Through constant feeds that go on forever and giving you push notifications on your phone, social media sites try their best to keep you on their app or website. And if you leave, they want you to come back as quickly as possible. Google and Facebook further their reach by also being commonly used to sign in to other sites. Social media sites always seem to have a significant impact on how you feel, furthering your connection to them. Tattoos have often been presented in popular media as either marks of the dangerous and deviant or trendy youth fads. But while tattoo styles come and go, and their meaning has differed greatly across cultures, the practice is as old as civilization itself. Decorative skin markings have been discovered in human remains all over the world, with the oldest found on a Peruvian mummy dating back to 6000 BCE. But have you ever wondered how tattooing really works? You may know that we shed our skin, losing about 30 to 40,000 skin cells per hour. That's about a million per day. So how come the tattoo doesn't gradually flake off along with them? The simple answer is that tattooing involves getting pigment deeper into the skin than the outermost layer that gets shed. Throughout history, different cultures have used various methods to accomplish this. But the first modern tattooing machine was modeled after Thomas Edison's engraving machine and ran on electricity. Tattooing machines used today insert tiny needles loaded with dye into the skin 
at a frequency of 50 to 3,000 times per minute. The needles punch through the epidermis, allowing ink to seep deep into the dermis, which is composed of collagen fibers, nerves, glands, blood vessels, and more. Every time a needle penetrates, it causes a wound that alerts the body to begin the inflammatory process, calling immune system cells to the wound site to begin repairing the skin. And it is this very process that makes tattoos permanent. But what exactly happens to your body when you're in a coma? First, we have to be clear that comas are very different from sleep. Despite the fact that the origin of the word comes from the Greek for coma or deep sleep, comas are not sleep, however, and are instead various forms of unconsciousness that render a person unable to respond to any external stimuli. You can play the loudest, heaviest death metal in the world right next to someone who's comatose, and you won't succeed in doing anything except really annoying the neighbors. Likewise, you can even physically hurt people in a coma, and they will remain completely oblivious and unresponsive. In times in the not too distant past, this was sometimes used as treatment, with doctors trying to shock their victims back into consciousness. Everything was tried, from exposing parts of the body to open flames, to severely dropping the body's temperature with ice, to even bloodletting from the head directly. One treatment even included wholly emptying the stomach. We guess because the doctors thought that if a patient got hungry enough, the body would force them to wake up. Or maybe they really were just throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, at the problem, which we're sure was also tried. Comas can occur as a result of serious trauma or as a deliberate medical treatment by doctors. They are typically brought on by traumatic head injury, and it's believed that it's the brain's way of shutting down so it can focus on repairing itself. They can also, however, be brought on by a stroke or a brain tumor, drug or alcohol abuse, or an illness such as diabetes or infection. Most of the time, a coma only lasts a few weeks, though, but past this period, the patient can enter a persistent vegetative state that severely lessens their chance of ever coming back out of one. We've all heard the phrase, laughter is the best medicine, but why do we laugh in the first place? It seems that laughing might be a little more hardwired into us than you might think. Infants laugh very early in life, usually learning how to laugh before they can speak. Not only that, but people that are born blind and deaf 
can still exhibit laughter. One study found that the laughter produced from deaf participants was fundamentally similar to that produced by normal hearing individuals, backing up the idea that laughter is grounded in human biology. It's also been theorized that laughter predates human speech by potentially millions of years, being a simpler form of communication. Laughter is thought to have likely helped earlier people negotiate group dynamics and establish hierarchy. I can't even imagine trying to explain that I'm a little goofball using only laughter. So if laughter actually is instinctually part of humans, then why do people laugh? It seems like laughter is more of a way for people to better handle stress and make situations feel less threatening than laughter only being about things that we find to be funny. In practice, with a study of 1,200 people that laughed spontaneously in their natural environments, only about 10 to 20% of the laughing episodes followed anything that the researchers found to be joke-like. Finding something funny still seems to play a part in why we laugh some of the time, but laughing to make yourself feel better about your next difficult exam might be just as probable as cracking up over that joke you just heard. So the idea I'd like to propose today is this. One of the most effective ways of building strong fundamentals in students and preparing them for the future, ironically enough, is by looking to the past through the teaching of Latin. Latin will help students think more logically, communicate more effectively, and have a more comprehensive understanding of the world around them, no matter how technologically advanced that world may become. To begin with, let's address a common misconception that Latin is a dead language spoken by ancient Europeans 2,000 years ago, holding no relevance whatsoever for people living in the 21st century. There's even an old poem that expresses this point of view. Latin is a language as dead as dead can be. First it killed the Romans, and now it's killing me. Now, students may feel this way sometimes, but the, this simply is not true. The reality is that Latin never died. It never came to a crashing end with the death of a single tragic figure. It simply evolved gradually over time and developed into other languages. Moreover, classical Latin is still very much alive and well in government, art, religion, literature, medicine, law, and science. It's not a dead language, it's an eternal language. So the idea I'd like to...
Savior Jesus.